I want to actually, I want to show you guys a video before we go into the next part because we're going to talk about combustion now and more and, and explosions. So this is a nice video from a, a very famous uh, physicist, Feynman. You guys must have known, known his name, Richard Feynman, and maybe you've seen this video or not. It's just a few, four minutes or so, Feynman's explanation of, of combustion. The atoms like each other, the different degrees. Uh, oxygen, for instance, in the air, would like to be next to carbon, and if they get it near each other, they snap together. If they're not too close, though, they repel and they go apart, so they don't know that they could snap together. It's just as if you had a ball that was trying to climb a hill and there was a hole it could go into, like a volcano hole, a deep one. It's rolling along, it doesn't go down in the deep hole, because if it starts to climb the hill, and then rolls away again. But if you make it go fast enough, it'll fall into the hole. And so, if you touch something like wood in oxygen, this carbon in the wood from a tree, and the oxygen comes and hits it, carbon, but not hard enough, and just goes away again. The air is always coming, nothing's happening. If you can get it faster by heating it up somehow, somewhere, somehow, get it started, a few of them come fast, they go over the top, so to speak, they come close enough to the carbon and snap in, and that gives a lot of jiggly motion which might hit some other atoms, making those go faster so they can climb up and bump against other carbon atoms, and they jiggle, and they make mothers jiggle, and you get a terrible catastrophe, which is one after the other. All these things are going faster and faster and snapping in, and the whole thing is changing. That catastrophe is a fire. It's just a way of looking at it. And these things are happening, they're perpetual. Once it gets started, it keeps on going. The heat makes the other atoms capable of reaching to make more heat to make other atoms, and so on. So this terrible snapping is producing a lot of jiggling. And if I put, with all that activity of the atoms there, and I put a cup of coffee over that mess of wood that's doing this, it's going to get a lot of jiggling. So that's what the heat of the fire is. And then, of course, uh, if, you see, this is what happens when you start to think. You just go on and on. What the work? How did it get started? Why is it that the wood's been sitting around all this time with the oxygen all this time and it didn't do this earlier or something? Where did I get this from? Well, it came from a tree. And the, the substance of the tree is carbon. Where did that come from? That comes from the air. It's carbon dioxide from the air. People look at trees and they think it comes out of the ground. The plants grow out of the ground. But if you ask where the substance comes from, you find out where do they come from? The trees come out of the air? They surely come out of the air. No, they come out of the air. The carbon dioxide in the air goes into the tree and it changes it, kicking out the oxygen and uh, pushing the oxygen away from the carbon and leaving the carbon substance with water. Water comes out of the ground, you see. Only it had to get in there. It came out of the air, didn't it? It came down from the sky. So in fact, most of the tree, almost all of the tree is out of the ground. I'm sorry, it's out of the air. There's a little bit from the ground, some minerals and so forth. Now, of course, I told you the oxygen, we, we know the oxygen and carbon stick together, very tight. How is it the tree is so smart as to manage to take the carbon dioxide, which is the carbon oxygen nicely combined, and undo that so easy? Ah, life, life has some mysterious force. No, the sun is shining. And it's the sunlight that comes down and knocks this oxygen away from the carbon. So it takes sunlight to get the plant to work. And so the sun, all the time, is doing the work of separating the oxygen away from the carbon. The oxygen is some kind of terrible byproduct, which it spits back into the air and leaving the carbon and water and stuff to make the substance of the tree. Then when we take the substance of the tree and stick it in the fireplace, and the, there's all the oxygen made by these trees, and all the carbon would, would be much prefer to be close together again. And once you let the heat to get it started, it continues and makes an awful lot of activity while it's going back together again. And all this nice light and everything comes out. And everything is being undone. You're going back from carbon and oxygen back to carbon dioxide. And the light and heat that's coming out, that's the light and heat of the sun that went in. So it's sort of stored sun that's coming out when you burn a log. Next question, how is it the sun is so jiggly, so hot? 
I gotta stop somewhere. I'll leave you something to imagine. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. I mean, that's the spirit of what we do, right? So he, and he, he's talking kinetics, right? He's talking, but in very simple terms, he's explaining it, right? How first explaining how the fire happens, yeah, and the, the reaction of the carbohydrates in the wood, hydrocarbons, yeah, to form CO2 and water requires some heat to start it off, and he talks about that chain reaction proceeding and how, how uh, you get a terrible fire out of it. Yeah, and I, I mean, now we, we do a lot of work, yeah, right, uh, in burning fuels, and, we'll, and we say fossil fuels are bad, fossil fuels are uh, releasing a lot of CO2, well, they're just doing, undoing what was already done, right? The fossil fuels were all made from biomass millions of years ago, from sunlight and from, from carbon, CO2 from the air, and now it's just stored underground. We're just releasing it back uh, to where it came from. And he talks about the plants as well. So I, I do a lot of work now in uh, uh, converting CO2 with uh, green hydrogen to fuels. Well, it's the same thing the plants are doing, right? Plants are taking CO2 from the atmosphere. They take water from the ground. And actually, they split. They're doing water splitting reaction. They, they have uh, enzymes and chlorophyll uh, that they're able to split water to make hydrogen, and they use the hydrogen from the water to reduce CO2, to convert CO2 into carbon monoxide and then glucose. And they use the glucose to make uh, eventually polymers like lig cellulose, hemicellulose, lignin, the body, the mass of the tree. We want to use the same reaction, CO2 and hydrogen, to make fuels like methanol. Uh, you can make jet fuel, you can make gasoline. It's pretty complicated <laughs> and very expensive. We're trying to build like big facilities to take CO2 from the air, convert them with hydrogen that you can make from water by electrolysis to make these synthetic fuels. And eventually these fuels you can use in uh, you know, cars and in, in engines. Yeah? So rather than using fossil derived fuels, you can emulate what nature does and make uh, so-called e-fuels or synthetic fuels. So I think it's interesting. I like, I like how uh, <laughs> Feynman explains it all. And but the most important thing, he keeps asking questions, right? You know, that's what's the fun of science, yeah? And in kinetics, it's the same way. You keep on building models, you may do experiments, and you keep asking interesting questions that, uh, well, why things are happening the, w the way that they're happening. Okay, so we're gonna actually talk more about now fire, combustion, explosion, how do you get this chain reaction that's so violent to happen? So uh, we were talking, we were talking about bromine, hydrogen. Actually, there was one question uh, people had in the break, they said, why don't we call hydrogen plus hydrogen bromide, or H radical plus hydrogen bromide going to hydrogen plus bromo radical, an inhibition step? Well, it is an inhi inhibition step, okay? It's a propagation step because it's propagating radicals, but it's also inhibition because it's inhibiting the formation of the desired product, HBr. So again, these are just general terms we use, initiation, propagation, inhibition. So some reactions can be both. It can be an inhibition. It can also be a propagation. And we'll add another class of reaction we call branching step in the next part. Okay, now, actually, I'm going to skip over these slides because I think we get the point, okay? The rest, the remaining slides about hydrogen bromide, I'm just uh, presenting uh, the equations. But with these equations, we're going to apply some uh, fictitious rate constants. And that's uh, shown in this table. Yeah, we, we just apply some fictitious rates, rate constants for each of these reactions, and we, up, we use those rates to calculate uh, the same thing I, I've already been showing. you. So rather than a qualitative understanding of why we get this rate equations, this, the next slides are just a quantitative uh, representation of how you get the same answers. And if you apply these, these rate constants, Ks, you can then, uh, you know, you can start to calculate these are profiles of species. And these, again, these are fictitious. These aren't the real values, but I just wanted to show you an example. And uh, you can take a look at that on your own time. I don't think we need to go through, through all this. You, it's all, so everything up to like, yeah, slide 20 is the same stuff. So we're gonna skip to explosions, yeah? Uh, explosions, yeah, slide 21 or so, maybe a bit. Maybe a bit two slides less for you guys because I had added some slides. So interesting thing to note, if you take hydrogen 
and you bromine, bromine, even if you take acetaldehyde, and you put these in a reactor, an isothermal reactor, you fix the temperature of the reactor, uh, some reactions will happen. And in the, in the end, you might get hydrogen bromide. For acetaldehyde decomposition, you'll get some ethane, you'll get some methane. But uh, the mixture will never explode. It never blow up in your face like a performing acid or, or many other things, yeah? So, yeah, people, people but people uh, in 100 years ago were, of course, uh, ex uh, observing explosions everywhere. The automotive engine was already invented, right? You had diesel engines, you had gas, SI, gas auto engines that used gasoline. You had explosions and fires happening. And All right, okay, so we're talking about explosions, fires, okay? And uh, let's, let's explain now why these things happen. Okay, so again, I said hydrogen, bromine, you put them in a vessel, acetaldehyde, nothing really happens, nothing too dangerous. Uh, but uh, again, people were observing fires in those days. And it was a Christian, Christensen, the same uh, student who got his PhD thesis with Bodenstein, who said that, okay, maybe he was observing explosions and fires in industry and in, uh, you know, in society. And he assumed that, okay, explosions could be due to some, some type of radical chain reaction as well. And uh, he said, okay, they speculated that perhaps this is the reason. But they, at the time of Christensen, it was still only a specific. Uh, all right, so uh, yeah, anyway, I don't need to repeat anything. So it, uh, yeah, it was the first experimental proof of why uh, explosions may be occurring were by, by Semenov and Hinshelwood. So Semenov, uh, again, experimentally was looking at uh, phosphorus as a vapor and oxygen. And uh, he, uh, he, saw, he saw that as he increased the partial pressure of oxygen in the system, uh, you would get an explosion. But eventually, if you increased it some more, the explosion uh, would go away. So depending on some limits of oxygen concentration, uh, there was observed to be an explosion. Later on, he postulated that this was a chain branching. Similarly, Hinshelwood, uh, the same guy who's been, we've been talking about for a long time, he was looking at hydrogen oxygen system, and he also found that, the, again, these explosions happened within certain limits. So these two, uh, because of their contribution to society, uh, primarily around, related around safety, right? Uh, and the application of then chemical kinetics and chemical reaction mechanism for systems that were uh, previously not well understood in terms of their safety, uh, they won the Nobel Prize. So, of course, they applied chemical kinetics to many different things like decomposition reactions, uh, photochemical reactions, even biological systems. But what wins them the prize is the application of these things to, to explosions, yeah, because of the uh, very important societal safety uh, relevance of that problem. So the experiments that uh, Hinshelwood did in the early days were hydrogen and oxygen. Very simple. You take hydrogen. Like you had hydrogen and bromine, hydrogen and iodide. Now hydrogen and oxygen, let's try, out, out, try that out and see what happens. And indeed it was known that hydrogen and oxygen can react to form water. But they took a, he took a vessel, again a spherical vessel, and uh, fixed the temperature of that vessel and then start increasing the pressure in the vessel. As you increase the pressure, of course, uh, the density of the gas increases and you would expect as pressure increases, concentration increases, everything should become faster, yeah? More reactions should happen. And the very basic diagrams that they figured in those days were, uh, again, at a fixed temperature, you would increase the pressure from vacuum to, as you increase the pressure, there would be a very slow reaction between hydrogen and oxygen. You'd be on the left side of this curve. Nothing would be really happening. Then, eventually, you would uh, increase the pressure and suddenly there would be an explosion, which means the system goes to completion. Hydrogen and oxygen instantaneously converted to water and uh, no more reaction. And all of this happens very quickly, right? In a matter of uh, microseconds. Similarly, you keep, keep redo this experiment at a higher pressure, higher pressures, higher pressure, explosion would be happening. At some point, he would, uh, again, fix the temperature, introduce the gases at a pressure, let's say, 100 torr, and there would be no explosion. And, well, it's strange. It 
should be monotonic. We keep increasing pressure, the explosion should keep happening. Well, no, it's not the case. At some point, the actually explosion goes away. And at that point, from 100 torr, you could decrease the pressure and you could get an explosion. So the first limit was there at very low pressure. A second limit at some intermediate pressure, there would be uh, an explosion condition. But again, if you went from 100 torr, you kept increasing, there'd be no explosion, no explosion, no explosion. And then eventually, an explosion at this so-called third limit at a very high pressure. And he's trying to understand why this is the case. Uh, the first, first, they thought it was an experimental anomaly, yeah? So maybe it's just the way we're doing the experiments is a problem. Uh, so what they do is they uh, make the vessel bigger and bigger and bigger. And sometimes when the vessel is very small, the explosion happens uh, more frequently, yeah? Uh, at lower pressures. And they found that, okay, the walls of the vessel are contributing to the process, yeah? There, something is happening with the wall and there might be chemical reactions. Maybe the wall of the vessel is activating some chemical reactions. So it's an experimental anomaly, make the vessel bigger, same thing happens. Eventually they make the vessel big enough and it's not dependent on the size of the vessel anymore. So you keep reproducing, okay, you get the same observations regardless of the size of the vessel and the so-called quality of the wall. Sometimes they passivate the wall, they put some different chemicals there or they change the material from stainless steel or steel to, to quartz, and they see a difference. Eventually they say a big quartz reactor of sufficient size, all the results are reproducible. And this is so relevant today, you know, I encourage you if you're doing experiments in a reactor, consider the material of your reactor, the size of your reactor, because that can have an impact. Shock tubes, yeah, a lot of passivation has to be done on the surface of the shock tube to make sure the experiments are truly Kinetic, kinetically controlled in the gas phase, not related to the surface. Uh, we'll talk more about these things. Uh, flow reactors, you should be using quartz. Now many people are doing ammonia-related chemistry. Anybody doing ammonia? Ammonia experiments or ammonia. It's common now to do ammonia with NO, nitrous, nitric oxide, because ammo, ammonia, when it burns, it makes NO. And uh, people want to know the impacts of NO on ammonia. Well, NO also reacts readily on surfaces to make NO2. So many people are doing ammonia experiments today with NO, and they're getting weird results, and they don't know why. And, but if you go to conferences, you learn from others, uh, you gotta passivate the surfaces, uh, typically with water passivation first, then do the experiment. And then you can ensure that, you know, surface is not influencing. So like this, many systems, you gotta be careful, and Hinshelwood is a good, good experimentalist. Make sure that it's not an experimental anomaly, Eventually, he finds that the vessel quality uh, and the vessel size are not, are not the contributors to the phenomena once you get a sufficient size. Okay, and then, of course, the second and third limits, he found that were never dependent on the vessel size. Even at, at all vessel sizes, th those were quite reproducible. So why does this happen? Well, again, we, we can look at this uh, chart. Eventually, you know, we need hydrogen and half oxygen to go make water. This vessel, uh, this vessel is typically placed in a bath, heated oil bath of a fixed temperature, and then they vary the pressure and they conduct uh, these experiments. And they then try to explain why this might be the case. So the postulate was, again, it's some kind of complex reaction mechanism. It can't be a very simple reaction mechanism that uh, is contributing to this because Clearly, this is not related to mass action kinetics because even the overall observation of reactants going to products is not, uh, yeah, not dependent on the concentration of the species in a linear way. It's a very complex dependence. So they postulated this simple 11-step mechanism in the beginning. First reaction, we say initiation. Even it's not an elementary reaction. In, in, if we look at this reaction today, we say this is not an elementary reaction. Hydrogen plus oxygen going to H radical and HO2. Uh, essentially, there, he's saying the oxygen goes and abstracts the hydrogen from the hydrogen, giving you H radical and HO2. Uh, quite an unlikely scenario. But again, this is his postulate at that time. And we can forgive him for that. He got the Nobel Prize, so I mean, who am I to say he was wrong? Okay, <laughs> and uh, second reaction, OH plus H2, 
propagation step, right? So OH reacts with hydrogen. This is, a, this is a reaction we have in all models today. Goes to H plus water, that's a propagation step. A third step called a branching step. So branching is now H plus O2 goes to O, H plus O. Okay, our most famous combustion reaction. If there's any reaction you ever have to remember, it's H plus O2 goes to O plus OH, yeah? Because this is what leads to explosion in any system. I don't care what your fuel is, yeah? Every hydrocarbon fuel, oxygenated fuel, ammonia, in the end, everything breaks down to hydrogen, and this reaction then contributes to your high temperature ignition point. H plus O2 goes to O plus OH, and it's the most important reaction in, in combustion uh, chemistry for high temperature explosion or ignition phenomena. Then branching, again, okay, another branching step, different kinds, okay? This one now hydrogen reacts with O to give us O plus OH plus H. So again, the difference between a propagation and branching, propagation, one radical goes in, one radical comes out. A branching reaction, one radical goes in, two radicals come out. That's the only difference, okay? Then you have termination. So termination now H plus O2 plus M. And he says, he calls this a termination reaction because you take a very active radical, like H radical, and you make a less active radical. So some people might say it's propagation. He says it's termination because HO2 is not very active. It's fine, either way, uh, you can call it what you want. This is a potential reaction. And then he says there's also terminations with the wall. He wants to describe that radicals hitting against the walls of your vessel can get passivated, yeah? Can get prevented from participating in your reaction system. So H, O, OH, which he says are the key radicals, uh, react with the wall and they terminate. Similarly, you have another potential initiation step, the formation of hydrogen peroxide by HO2 plus hydrogen. Uh, again, you might say this is a propagation step because we have two radicals, but he calls this initiation because it creates H radical. And H radical is the more active radical, so whenever you make it, it's an initiation step. And then termination, two HO2s go to form uh, hydrogen peroxide. And another initiation step, hydrogen peroxide breaks down to form two OH radicals. Also another very important reaction. This leads to what we call intermediate temperature uh, ignition. So typically, you can have high temperature explosion and ignition, that's H plus O2 goes to O plus OH. But at intermediate temperatures, you can have heat release, not necessarily enough for an ignition, but it, it, enough to quickly accelerate the reactivity of your system. That's due to this hydrogen peroxide decomposition. All right, then he, then he explains, in simple terms, yeah, in this mechanism, the first limit is not achieved at very low pressures because one, you still have all these reactions happening with the wall. So you might have initiation, radical being formed, but these radicals are colliding with the wall and uh, they're not colliding with each other because the pressure is low, so the gas density is low, the molecules are far apart, so to speak. So they hit the walls rather than hitting each other and they don't react. So no explosion. Then he says, after you cross a certain point, the gas density is high enough that uh, you can have, rather than colliding with the wall, the reactants, uh, the radicals will react with each other or they'll react with hydrogen and oxygen. So they'll lead to propagation, branching, uh, production of more radicals. So very simply, he'll say that branching steps two, three, and four become dominant as you increase the pressure. And if you sum up the amount of radicals that are produced in these different steps, you eventually get a net, you know, one H radical goes in, three H radicals come out. As simple as that, just based on the stoichiometry. Again, one radical goes in, they keep going, and then this process continues. So that's the explosion. It's just a simple, what we call chain propagation or chain branching of radical species, purely of species. And just based on this. Then you increase the pressure some more, and he says that H plus O2, now you have the pressure is so high, there's more collisions between radicals and uh, reactants. Uh, so he says H plus O2 plus M, M meaning the total pressure of the system is now high enough that HO2 is formed. And he, again, like he said, he said this is a termination reaction because it's not making H radical. H radical was the active one. 
now we have a less active radical. So in this region, there's no, no explosion. And then finally, he says, uh, at the very high pressure limit, you have a new initiation reaction. HO2, which was formed in the previous termination step, can now react with hydrogen because there's enough HO2 that's being produced at high temperature, uh, sorry, high pressure, that you make H radical again, and then this H radical uh, can, can participate in reactions, but also HO2 can make hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide decomposes to make OH radical. And now you have your third explosion limit. So this was his way of understanding, just based on the amount of radicals that are being produced and the types of radicals, at which pressures you're observing these, uh, these different limits. And there was no even math at that time involved with it. He doesn't need to explain a net increase in radicals explaining the phenomena that, uh, that he had, he's observing. So in all of this, you have two different types of, uh, we can say, chain reactions that we can observe. So first, Bodenstein, Christensen, Polanyi, they all observe what we call open chain reactions. These are chain reactions where you initiate, you have a propagation of radicals, and eventually you lead to your products. And this is what, if you were to plot these out, again, all those mass balance equations like I showed previously, if you were to solve them, you would see, okay, you would take hydrogen and bromine, they would react with each other to form product species like hydrogen, HBr, Br, and so on, over a function of time, you would never have like a rapid runaway or explosion of the system. However, the other kind of what we call branched chain reactions, this is where those chain reactions now also include a net increase in the number of radicals, and such as a hydrogen and oxygen system, uh, we see that again, hydrogen and oxygen can react with each other, but eventually, at some conditions, they will be depleted so quickly that will lead to a huge production of radical species and then uh, you will uh, eventually form your products. Now, important thing to note, in, in uh, typical chain propagation, we can make these assumptions like quasi-steady state approximations, right? So, because the buildup of radicals happens quickly and then it stays uh, pretty constant, there's a steady state approximation that's valid. In a, in a chain branching system, that's not true, right? Because the number of radicals is keep multiplying because of the nature of the reactions that are happening. So you can't make this assumption uh, prior to the explosion that you have quasi steady state approximation. If you did, you'd be assuming the system is at steady state. And it's not at steady state. It's building up radicals very quickly until some condition is met, which is the explosion. A yeah, key thing to note, this kind of open chain reaction is very common in alkane pyrolysis. So pyrolysis is, again, we talked about uh, ethane, ethane going to ethylene. So ethane dehydrogenation to go to ethylene. That's a pyrolysis, yeah. So this is your classical. This can happen by a chain reaction, but it's an open chain reaction. If you did this, you take ethane, you heat it up, 1100 C, uh, 1300K or so, uh, 1400K, you know, decompose to form ethylene and hydrogen. This reaction can keep happening by a free radical mechanism, but it would never explode in your face, yeah? So any type of pyrolysis mechanism, uh, even you take fuels, you pyrolyze them in the absence of oxygen, you'll, you'll have an open chain reaction, but it will not, uh, yeah, it will not explode. Similar polymerization, now you take ethylene and you polymerize it to make polyethylene, that happens by a chain reaction. You have a typically an initi initiation step by a, a polymer initiate, polymer, polymerization initi initiator. That initiator will activate ethylene to allow polyethylene to be made, yeah? So these are very common in chemical industries, pyrolysis processes, polymerization reactions. But open chain reaction is needed anytime you have explosions ignition like we see in engines. So all in these cases, we will always have an open chain reaction. So chain branching steps have to be included. Yeah, even, so if we talk about some phenomena, flame speeds, 
you know, flame propagation, you need, uh, you need also there some type of open chain reaction. You need chain branching steps, uh, any type of ignition phenomena, and so on. Okay, so let's be clear. There's two different types of explosions that can be happening. So first type of explosion is what we call a, a thermal explosion, okay? Well, let's just, the first one we just, we already covered already. So based on this hydrogen oxygen mechanism in this reaction scheme, we can have something called a chemical explosion. And this explosion is only because you keep on increasing the number of radicals in the system and the chain carriers, these radicals eventually leads to a very high reaction rate and finally to an explosion. So it's a purely chemical driven phenomenon. It has nothing to do with heat. I mean, even this system could be so dilute. Uh, yeah, let me go back here. This system could be very dilute. It could be nearly isothermal. You could have very little oxygen, very little hydrogen in a system of maybe 99% argon. And uh, the overall temperature release would be negligible. Even after the point of explosion, uh, you would have an explosion, but it wouldn't be a, a thermal explosion. The temperature wouldn't run away. So it's a purely chemical-driven phenomenon. Reactants go to products in a very rapid step due to the buildup of many uh, intermediate radical species. So this is what we call chemical explosion, or yeah, chemically radically driven explosion, which is different than a thermal explosion. So thermal explosion just means you have a reaction which is exothermic, and you can't dissipate the heat fast enough. And of course, as temperature rises, the rate increases, yeah, K, every co rate constant increases with temperature because of the Arrhenius law. And as temperature increases, you eventually uh, make the reactions faster. And uh, eventually, the reactions become so fast, the system just reacts very quickly because the temperature is so high. So that's what we call exothermic, thermally driven explosion. If you don't dissipate the heat fast enough, the increased rate with the increased temperature feeds back, and this process leads to uh, eventual explosion. So thermal explosion, you don't need to have this type of radical chain mechanism. Yeah? You can have, again, as long as you don't dissipate the heat, your system could explode. However, most, most of the time, branch chain reactions also lead to thermal explosion because many of these reactions we see are all exo they're all exothermic, yeah? So ignition phenomena in combustion systems, uh, they are all, they're all driven by chain branching reactions. They're all exothermic. And because the exothermicity happens so quickly, you can never dissipate the heat fast enough. So eventually, we say all these chain explosions or these chemically driven explosions are also uh, thermal, thermal explosions just by the nature of the system. But a thermal explosion can happen even in a system where you're not increasing the number of radicals. It's just an inability to manage the heat effectively. Okay, so that's how guys did this 100 years ago, okay? How they figured all this out. Uh, today, we study the same problems, but we have a big difference. We solve all of this with uh, computers, and we're able to figure out these explosion limits to much more accuracy. So it's no longer like a qualitative understanding. What Semenov and Hinshelwood provided were qualitative understandings of these different limits based on experiments. But now we have models with uh, hundreds of reactions and uh, many, many species, and we can predict explosions, ignition, all this chain branching, chain propagation, uh, concentrations of radicals as a function of time in, in very complex systems because of computational abilities. So we see here a chart on the left showing uh, Moore's law, right? Since the advent of computers in 1970s, how many transistors are, have increased? And we can see, this is a nice paper by Professor Law, I think around 2000, I'm going to say seven or eight, uh, showing how chemical kinetic models have also increased in size. So we have number of species on the x-axis, number of species on the y-axis, reactions on the y-axis. So GRI MEC, how many, how many people have used GRI MEC? Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, 1992, and we still use it, yeah, 30 years later. Uh, and it's a pretty good model for one built in 1992. Uh, so GRI MEC, 
what was it, about a few hundred species, a few hundred reactions for methane uh, combustion. I think also natural gas mixtures they had. Uh, and then you can see, uh, so, and nowadays, you know, we have models that are up here, which are like uh, tens of 10,000 species even. Uh, you can have several tens of thousands of reactions, maybe 30,000 reactions. Uh, and that's, again, because we just have computers which are able to solve all those mass balance equations uh, that we've been talking about relatively quickly. And, uh, of course, it's, it's feasible to do this in batch reactors and stirred reactors and flow reactors. It's still very difficult to use these models in a CFD simulation because when you have a million cells or 10 million cells that you need to calculate, it takes too long to calculate all those differential equations for the species mass balances. Okay, but nevertheless, with this understanding of uh, how chemical kinetic models are built, we can revisit how this hydrogen-oxygen explosive diagram looks. So again, we need to explain these different limits, but now in more uh, quantitative sense. So we again, we come back to a very general formulation for the chemical ignition phenomena. So first we say we have four different types of reactions. Uh, nowadays, we don't really pay much attention to the wall reaction because the systems we study, hydrogen and oxygen explosion, no longer are sensitive to the wall. But we always say there's initiation step, which is the generation of radicals, propagation steps, which are uh, producing more radicals, and termination steps, which are consuming the radicals. And this, the ratio of uh, alpha, alpha is the amount of radicals that are produced in all your propagation, and we can add here branching steps, okay, not only propagation. Uh, if, this, if the net, net alpha leads to less than one, meaning you don't increase the number of radicals, you have termination. If alpha is equal to one, the number of radicals is constant, you're propagating. If it's greater than one, we call this uh, branching. And again, we can assume some type of steady state for radicals, and we can write that the radical concentration has this format. And finally, we can get that if there's an increase in the radical concentration, the explosion will happen as long as alpha is greater than one, but also the rates of some reactions like K2 and K3. And K2 has to be fast enough, the propagation step. K3 has to be slow enough not to increase, induce termination. And also K4 has to not induce termination. So, yeah, it's just a simple way to look at, okay, if you want the radicals to explain how the radicals run away very quickly, you need, of course, a very large number of propagation and branching steps, but you also need the rates of those steps, the Ks, to be much faster than the rate of termination. And hence, now you get these kinds of models. So this is a model from Professor Law's book for oxidation and combustion of hydrogen. And this is how most models will look now today if you want to predict uh, things like ignition phenomena, explosion phenomena. So first, you see you have a series of chain reactions, so hydrogen and oxygen. So again, the first most famous reaction, H plus O2 goes to O plus OH. Now you have the actual kinetic parameters for this reaction. Okay, he writes it as B, alpha, and Ea. Well, B, he's just saying is the pre-exponential term. Alpha is your T to the N term, the N, and uh, Ea, activation energy. So first step, he writes chain branching step and then a series of propagation steps. So again, O reacts with hydrogen to make H plus OH. You can say this is chain, uh, chain branching, sorry. This is actually, the second one is branching. Uh, third one, OH plus H2, this is a propagation step. You convert OH radical to H radical, and so on. Then you have some recombination reactions. So hydrogen dissociation is a dissociation in the forward step, but it's recombination in the reverse step. So initiations are simply the reverse of, uh, of recombination reactions. Again, oxygen recombination dissociation, they're both initiation termination steps and so on. And the rates of these are given. These are formation and consumption of HO2 radical intermediate. You see you're forming uh, 
things like water, you can also form, convert HO2 to OH radical, and so on. And then finally, formation and consumption of the hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. So H2O2 is formed from HO2, but it then decomposes to make OH radicals, which is a propagation reaction. So these types of reaction mechanisms now are very common. I think 19 steps, 20 steps is pretty common for hydrogen. So, and how many species we have? We have hydrogen, oxygen, O, OH, uh, H2O, HO2, and H2O2. So there's about seven species in this mech. So seven, eight species, 20, 25 reactions is enough for hydrogen. Uh, now you're going to methane, you add carbon, now you're going more species, more. And now you start to understand why when we come to jet fuel, diesel fuel, gasoline, it's, it's not tens of reactions and dozens of species, it's, you know, it's in the thousands. And because we've got to build up the mechanism and eventually everything comes back to hydrogen in the end as it breaks down and that leads to the explosion. So that makes what's, that's what makes the mechanisms uh, so complicated. So what, what do we need to do? In order to understand the explosion diagram, we need to, of course, know how the rate of change of concentrations of species are, but we need to know all these rates. And these rates are all as a function of temperature. And we said some rates, some reactions will be faster than others at different conditions. And that's what's going to lead to the explosive phenomena. So if we were to plot all these rates, you know, typically what I would do whenever I get a reaction mechanism, I have a simple Excel sheet or a, a MATLAB code, and I'll take a look at all the rates. And uh, as a function of temperature, just to see before I even run the code, how these rates are looking. So here we can see here, like uh, the reaction of H plus O2 goes to O plus OH. It's very slow at low temperatures, right? Uh, it's much slower than some of the competing reactions, like AO plus H2 goes to H plus OH. Yeah, this is the blue line, is a much faster reaction than the, the typical H plus O2 goes to O plus OH. Uh, similarly, this other reaction here is o, o, o radical plus water goes to form OH plus OH. That's actually a much faster reaction. I think I can't see very well on my screen. Yeah, I think that's the last reaction. So, you know, some of these reactions are faster at lower temperature, but as temperature increases, many of them converge to, to a pretty fast value. You know, the collision limits are typically around 10 to the 13, 10 to the 14. So, most reactions, once you're crossing 10 to the 12, uh, they're already very fast, yeah? But in, this lo in the lower temperature regime, they're very slow. And this explains, you know, this H plus O2 goes to O plus OH. It's a very slow reaction at low temperature. That's why the systems don't explode at 500 Kelvin, 600 Kelvin, 700 Kelvin. It takes, it has to be above 1,100 uh, degrees Kelvin for this reaction to become fast enough that your system actually uh, leads to a lot of chain branching. And then again, you can look here. These are, I guess, some of the termination steps. So you can see termination steps, H plus OH, uh, H plus O2. These are actually quite fast reactions, actually much faster than some of these uh, propagation and branching steps, okay, at, at, at low temperature. And that's what prevents the explosion from happening. But you see, as temperature increases, these reactions are actually decreasing. So some reactions have a negative temperature dependence. They don't necessarily increase with, the, with temperature. So and these termination reactions are having a negative temperature dependence. Hence, at higher temperatures, you get the, the propagation branching more favored, the termination less favored. So we will look again in more, uh, more detail now at this chart. Now we know what the rate constants actually look like. So again, we have three limits. First limit at low pressures and uh, intermediate temperatures, then at high pressure, or intermediate pressures, and then eventually at high pressures. And we can understand uh, this system's uh, limits based now both on the rates and on the nature of the chemical reactions. Like, are they initiation? Are they branching, propagation? Are they termination? So this is uh, Professor Law's explanation of the system. Uh, at high pressures, you have H plus O2. No, let me close that door. 
Okay, he's gone. So uh, at very high pressures, so le let's say we're up here at the top. Okay, the high pressure limit is related, is driven mainly by this reaction, H plus O2 plus M, the high pressure, reacting to form HO2, then H2 plus HO2 reacts to form H plus H2O2, and then H2O2 decomposes to 2OH. So this, again, the mechanism here is that you're forming hydrogen peroxide at high pressures, and hydrogen peroxide decomposes to form 2OH radicals, which are very reactive and uh, lead to a chemi chemical explosion. And the rate for this reaction is around 8.4, this should be, sorry, times 10 to the 11, T to the minus 0.8. And uh, yeah, and if you plot this reaction and you look at the system, depending on, as the temperature increases, of course, at this third limit, as the temperature increases, this reaction should get faster. And therefore, as you increase temperature going here to the right, uh, at lower pressures, you'll have an explosive regime. Now, the low pressure mechanism, he says it's driven by H plus O2 goes to O plus OH, uh, and then also H2 plus O goes to O plus OH, two different chain branching reactions. And this K low pressure rate constant looks like this, 2.33 times 10 to the 11 E to the minus 16,650 over RT. And again, this reaction, as you go to higher temperatures, favors the explosion. And that's what governs this first limit. And then finally, the ratio between this first and uh, the ratio between the low pressure limit and high pressure limit rates and the pressure is what describes this intermediate regime, temperature regime, okay? So again, depending on these rates, uh, depending on the actual pressure and temperature of your system, you can now calculate these three different limits simply from this, uh, this uh, function. So the to overall function is the ratio of the rates times the total pressure, and then, of course, the temperature of your system. You can then determine what the different limits of these points are. Okay, nowadays, I think uh, Professor Law has explosion diagrams with even like uh, more than three different limits. I think there are even up to about five limits in terms of hydrogen oxygen explosion because at some temp low, very low pressures, you can even have explosions. At much higher pressures, you can have more turning point conditions. Uh, depending on the nature of your system, uh, sometimes if you have a flame present, you can have additional turning points in these ignition curves. So I think if you guys study the combustion physics book, you'll learn about all these things in great detail. But this, all of it comes down to the basic uh, chemical kinetics of the different reactions that are happening in the system. Okay, uh, now I'm just gonna write some uh, r basic rate expressions on the board to see, again, these, this is how I've tried to explain in the last one and a half, two hours or so, how these mechanisms were derived, uh, how the rates uh, are established, and then used to explain some very complex phenomena, like, well, actually complex in the sense that hydrogen oxygen is relatively sis simple system, but from the standpoint of an explosion, it's still very complex. So again, based on this, people have been able to uh, articulate explosion limits, even without calculating in great detail all the species concentrations. But nowadays, we want to take all this stuff, we want to put it in the computer code, and we want the computer code to solve for us uh, the change in temperature, the change in species, so that mass and energy balances. So uh, I'll just briefly show you guys what this looks like in, in like a code like Kantara or Chemkin. So essentially you have a system of, of uh, equations, and these system of equations are going to tell us how to calculate the rate of change of species uh, as a function of time, depending on the kinetics that you put in. Okay, this is just saying that you have a, uh, this is how we can generally write a chemical equation. 
So a chemical equation is simply the sum of the reactants, yeah, multiplied by some species. We just say X here is just some chemical notation for a species. It's not a mass fraction or anything. It's just a chemical notation. It could be ethane, it could be ethylene, it could be methane, it could be hydrogen, oxygen, doesn't matter. It's just a chemical notation for some species K. And nu i is a uh, stoichiometry number, okay? Integer number for the stoichiometric stoichiometri coefficient. Okay, pretty straightforward. So you could write your reaction just like this as an equation. So the sum of the reactants uh, with reactant species one with the uh, stoichiometric coefficient of the species could be, could be two reactants, three reactants, and then same thing for the products. Ah, sorry, I just, this should be a double prime. So double prime is for the products, single prime is for the reactants. So you can write your reactions like this, and then you can build a stoichiometric matrix Let's say our system has uh, hydrogen, oxygen, O, OH, H2, and H2O. So each column in this matrix is a, a species, yeah? And each row is a reaction. So let's say you have reaction one, reaction two, reaction three, this is a stoichiometric matrix, so all it has is the relationship between the stoichiometry of different species in, in each reaction. So minus one, let's say minus one, 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 zero, zero. So this first reaction is minus for a reactant plus for a product for the stoichiometric coefficient. The first reaction is H plus O2 goes to O plus OH. That's how it would look in the, in the matrix, yeah? Second reaction, one, zero, minus one, one, minus one, zero. So this is the reaction of O plus H2 goes to form H plus OH. So H2 plus O, yeah, it gives us HOH plus H. And finally, we can say a third reaction, one, zero, zero, minus one, Minus one, one. Okay, so this reaction says OH reacts with hydrogen to form H and water. So three of the reactions we saw previously, again, this would now, you could do this for 19 reactions if it's uh, for all those 19 steps we saw previously. And, and these, uh, in this case, we have six species because we don't have HO2. You could add HO2, a reaction is HO2, you would add a column for that. Now we, if we need to do a, for a real fuel, we might have a thousand reaction matrix, so a thousand rows, 200, 200 columns, it becomes a very big matrix. Yeah. So the production rate of any of these species is what we want to determine. We call it, say omega is the production rate for any species K. So omega K is equal to the sum of the stoichiometric coefficient for species K in the I3 action times the progress variable. Q in the I3 action. So this is for K species from, from species one to uh, overall capital K. And again, the, this new KI is just a change in stoichiometric coefficient for any species K in a, in a reaction I, okay? 
because this is, a, let's say, the net change in the stoichiometry. Some reactions you might have the reactant in the reactant and the product. So they're just saying that sometimes if that's the case, then just make sure you account for the change in stoichiometry. So in this case, it's just a sum of the difference between the stoichiometric number in the reactant and the product for any specific reaction. And this Q is a progress variable. for the i-th reaction, okay? And we can calculate this. This is simply based on the kinetics. So Q of i is the forward rate constant in reaction I multiplied by the concentration of all the species, because remember, it's simple mass action kinetics for elementary reactions. So it's for species K, or it's for species X, for the k species, again, this is just some chemical notation for the species. It could be methane, ethane. We're just saying the concentration of any reactant raised to its stoichiometric coefficient in that reaction I minus KR, the reverse rate constant for the reaction multiplied by the concentration of the product species. Raised to their stoichiometric coefficient for the product species, so new double prime. And then we already talked about before K, we know what K is, K, F, K, I, you know, K, K, uh, K, F, K, I are simply related to the equilibrium. Equilibrium constant for any reaction uh, I. So there you have it. These are all the equations you need to, to solve all the mass balances for different species in, in your uh, stoichiometric matrix. So very, you have, if you have the progress variable, it just tells us, okay, for a specific reaction, how far has it progressed based on the temperature, which is K is a function of temperature, and based on the concentrations of the species in that reaction. Uh, here, we're simply saying that this reverse rate could, get, be, could be obtained from the forward rate divided by the equilibrium constant. Equilibrium constant we can get from the thermodynamic properties, the delta G of the reaction. So if you have the thermal chemistry of each species in a reaction, you can calculate K, capital K, equilibrium constant. You can get the reverse rate from the forward rate on that constant. Then from this progress variable, you can determine the production rate of all the species, the rate of change of species. Uh, with time based on the progress variable in each of each species in, in each reaction it's participating in. You do this for all the reactions for all the species. You get then the mass balances. Of course, this will change uh, depending on the nature of your, your reactor. You might have a batch reactor, uh, a flow reactor, a stirred reactor. So based on your standard uh, equations for those systems, you will put this basic uh, reaction equations or species mass balance equations into those reactor equations. Okay, then we will uh, spend about an hour with the break. So I'll, I'll pause, try to come back in the next 10, 12 minutes, or I'll give 12, 15 minutes, and then we will uh, just finish discussing the, the pressure dependent reactions. <laughs>